as analysts of international politics contemplate the end of the liberal international order, the most important question that follows is what will replace it. One perspective which comes from international relations theory is that we might see the emergence of a geopolitical order which might be similar in certain respects to the pre-Westphalian international order of medieval Europe. This is the proposed concept of neo-medievalism. Now the concept of neo-medievalism has been explored in international relations theory since the 1960s. But it was given its clearest articulation by Hedley Bull in his book The Anarchical Society written in 1977. Bull proposed, and I'm reading from his book, that it is conceivable that sovereign states might disappear and be replaced not by a world government in the future, but by a modern and secular equivalent of the kind of universal political organization that existed in Western Christendom in the Middle Ages. In that system, no ruler or state was sovereign in the sense of being supreme over a given territory and a given segment of the Christian population. Each had to share authority with vassals beneath and with the Pope and in Germany and in Italy and also the Holy Roman Emperor above. The universal political order of Western Christendom represents an alternative to the system of states, that is the Westphalian system of states. All authority in medieval Christendom was thought to derive ultimately from God and the political system was basically a theocratic one. It might therefore seem fanciful to, to contemplate a return to the medieval model, but it might not be fanciful to imagine that there might develop a modern and secular counterpart of that model, which embodies its central characteristic, that is, a system of overlapping authority and multiple loyalty. Now this last phrase is the key to understanding what the theory of neo-medievalism is. Now, the second important aspect is the point just raised just before, that just like in medieval Europe, there was above the state a transnational authority of the church on the other hand, on the one hand and the Holy Roman Emperor on the other, so in our times a secular authority might develop which performs that role over and above nation states and will add to whom people might also owe allegiance in addition to the nation state of which there are citizens. Now while the idea of neo-medievalism was only briefly explored before the 90s, in the 90s with the fall of the USSR, what was seen as the end of the post-war international order it began to attract interest again, especially from scholars looking for new ways to understand the effects of the processes of globalization, which were in a sense unleashed upon a world that was no longer ordered around this comforting structure of a clear East-West Cold War rivalry. So, gradually some theoretical models for understanding the interaction between these forces of globalization and the international system were developed and they began to converge with this idea of neo-medievalism of multiple overlapping authorities. So we might understand these new developments in the discipline of IR or international relations theory as a gradual attempt by scholars to factor in multiple aspects and levels, hierarchies in political life, in international political life also borrowing from sociology and other disciplines, to correct the simple two-dimensional models pervasive in IR theory, one of which was the billiard balls models proposed by Kenneth Waltz in the theory of neorealism, which saw the world as a pool table and various nation states as billiard balls forever clashing with each other. If they were making such simplistic models, no wonder they failed to predict anything. But moving on, gradually what emerged was a more nuanced three-dimensional model of international political life, which we will now explore. And this has implications for the future of the world that they imagined. So the foundational layer of this international system in this new model remained of the system of nation states. Now nation states remained the key actors in which the power of sovereignty lay and they remained the key actors were capable of acting and representing the populations on the international stage legitimately with legitimate authority. 
Now, while some scholars initially proposed that the nation state would gradually wither away, the new focus was on seeing how nation states would be transformed and how they would adapt to this new era of global politics. Now, this is important in context of the second layer of interaction, which we might call the transnational layer of the forces of globalization, which lie over and above the layer of nation states. And unlike the layer of nation states, is not fragmented by borders. So we might think of this layer as being constituted by flows, occurrence of capital, goods, data, even ideas and people across national boundaries. Now, the assumption was that the interaction between these two layers, between the forces of globalization and nation states, would lead to gradual homogenization of national societies. Now, that did happen, but only in certain domains. A homogenization is observable even now in patterns of consumption and even behavior to some extent of people across the world, but there has been a simultaneous resurgence of local identities. And this creates, in a sense, what is called the triple dilemma for Western international relations theory. That is, how to account for or reconcile the simultaneous existence of the relevance of the nation state, which continues to be the bedrock of the international system, above the nation state, this transnational layer in which we see these forces of globalization, and below the level of, of the nation state, we see processes of localization and sometimes even regional identities reasserting themselves. Now, this paradox was often, uh, is often expressed in the awkward concept of globalization, which has been adopted into political science from, from business, from international business theory. Now, the word globalization emerged from, the, from Japanese corporate culture in the 1980s. And the concept was influenced by the Japanese word dochakuka, which means living on one's own land. Now, Japan, in a sense, is the epitome of a globalized culture, a culture which is participating most actively in the field of globalization while cultivating its own local culture at home. It has since come to represent the persistence of local identities despite the overwhelming forces of globalization. And as I mentioned before, this has created a dilemma for Western international relations theorists who firmly believe that globalization would lead to a homogenization, not just of the international system, of the nature of the units which constitute the system, that is nation states would become more and more homogenized, and also societies within those nation states would become more and more homogenized under the predominant forces of globalization. Now, since these forces were flowing predominantly from the west to the east, it was also assumed that this homogenization would be essentially a westernization of the international system and various societies within nation states. But as Japan's case showed, global currents in this globalization system of globalization could be created from anywhere. And like Japan, soon other non-Western nations also began to manufacture their own culture and contribute to these forces of globalization. So the current was no longer flowing just from the west to the east. In fact, there were multiple currents, just like you have multiple currents in the ocean. Now, how do IR theorists then attempt to reconcile this? They had failed once to predict the fall of the USSR. After that, they developed new theories of globalization, which proposed that we would soon see this homogenization which also began to fail as we approach the 21st century. Now, the prominent prediction was because these theories had failed and because of the pervasiveness of these processes of localization. When localization reached a certain tipping point and began to extend itself from economics to culture to politics, it would lead, down, lead to a breakdown of states, of nation states across the world and would also lead to a prolonged era of disorder and pervasive civil wars in the international system. This was a warning of the coming anarchy, and this anarchy would, in a sense, be very, very medieval, thus the use of the word neo-medieval. Why will this happen? Because not only has the Western model of the nation state, for whatever reason, 
failed to homogeneously spread across the entire international system, but due to the forces of globalization, other non-Western models have begun to reassert themselves in different states, in different societies, in different parts of the world. And of course, from the perspective of Westphalian IR theory, because these orders, these new political orders which are resurging, reasserting themselves, come from non-Western and fundamentally pre-Westphalian societies, they are fundamentally products of, of an anarchic society which had once been ordered by Westphalian expansion during the age of European hegemony, but since that Westphalian expansion was now retreating, we would again see a reversal to an anarchy which would be very, very medieval. But if you recall, there was a second aspect of neo-medievalism. A secular transnational authority might emerge, similar to the Church or the Holy Roman Empire in Europe, and that might act as an ordering principle in the international system, in this new emerging international system. Now, as the IR scholar J. Fredericks reminds us, the idea of neo-medievalism is important in that it gives us a macro-historical perspective that is useful for developing analogies. He also proposes that we are definitely seeing overlapping authority and multiple loyalties emerge in this three-dimensional political order, international order which is emerging, and the Westphalian system is withering under the pressures of globalization. But we are seeing a universal logic also appearing over and above this entire system. This universal logic is being created in his view by participation of various societies and nations in the transnational economy and the continuing relevance of the nation state as an actor which participates in this in international forums and which creates new regimes of, of global governance. Now, Frederick says that the Middle Ages were characterized by a system of overlapping authority and multiple loyalty, but these centrifugal forces were held together by two overarching interdependent forms of universalism, the empire, which is the Holy Roman Empire on the one side, and Christianity with its transcendental claims on the other. Today, we are definitely seeing the emergence of overlapping authority and multiple loyalties, but these centrifugal forces are also held together by a new emergent form of universalism. That is the nation state with its claim for sovereign actorhood and the world market economy with its claims for efficiency. So the transnational realm is not just a place for forces of globalization. It is also a realm for these forces or these forums which lead to universalized universalism. So as we see these simultaneous processes of globalization and localization, what we are going to see ultimately is that nation states will transform or evolve or adapt to more closely reflect the needs and challenges of their societies. Keeping in mind that strictly following the Western model of the Westphalian nation state might not be suitable or even sensible for all societies. Note that even the home of the Westphalian nation state is no longer Westphalian. I'm of course talking about the European Union. But through the medium of these actors operating in the international market or in academia or other knowledge communities, but most importantly through the intermediation of representatives of nation states who meet in these global forums and create new regimes of international governance, we might together create a universal realm of order over and above this entire structure. We might think of these interactions as operating in different domains. So each of these domains will have their own logic or their own ordering principles. So geopolitics, geoeconomics, geostrategy, and even geotechnology will have their own logic, but might have a, their own logics of competition or a logic of collaboration. So finally, what is the value of neo-medieval theory? I approach this from two sides. Now, the implicit assumption in all this is that the medieval was seen as an era of disorder, while the Westphalian was seen as a creation of enlightened statesmen who brought order first to Europe and then as a consequence of European hegemony to the world. Now, authors like Robert Kaplan are explicit about what will happen in a post-Westphalian world. 
they speak of a coming anarchy and this is also implicit in Hedley Bull's work. But in some respects, the Westphalian order was also imposed on top of other pre-existing orders. And it is important to counter the association of pre-Westphalian international order with anarchy, and thereby positing that a post-Westphalian world will also be similarly anarchical. Now that view underestimates the political sophistication of, first of all, medieval European society, which after all, had its other universalizing logics that we discussed above and was also home to complex polities like the Byzantine Empire. And there was also uh, in the same domain other burgeoning cultures of the Islamic West, all of which were participating in different domains globally and also through vast continental systems like the Silk Road trade and the entire diplomacy and warfare in Eurasia. So there were other logics, there were other orders, and these orders were operating before Westphalia, and they cannot just be brushed away. Now take the Silk Road trading complex in itself, which extended from Eastern Europe across Central Asia and to the East, and through the coastal regions of Eastern China, it linked with an even vaster Indian Ocean trading world. This was early globalization, and that also had its effects on the world all of which need to be taken into account and theorized. Now, similarly, moving to the other side, the Americas were hardly the epitomes of Westphalianism even, even after the entry of Europeans. What also needs a different kind of theorization are the empires of Latin America, their interactions with native polities, the various colonies and confederations in North America, and their interactions with, again, very different types of native states. And what I personally find the most interesting, the emergence of new radical forms of states like Haiti. Now, all this cannot be understood solely through the logic of Westphalian order and anomalous, uh, anomalous anarchy. And we need more sophisticated theories to understand the world. So in conclusion, engaging with new medieval theory is useful, especially in two respects. It informs us how forces of globalization and localization are transforming the international system and nation states, leading to the withering of this Westphalian logic, or relegating it in its importance. It also gives us a model for how we can engage with pre-Westphalian international systems, especially by making analogies that draw lessons from the past and apply them to the future. So in that respect, it is useful. And for scholars of international relations, the question we should ask is, how might pre-Westphalian international and state systems in other regions inform us of what the future holds for those, re for those regions as the world is moving beyond this Westphalian system or the Westphalian system withers away from its hegemony at the top of the international system? In our times, we are witnessing another very medieval threat, a global pandemic. I just use the word medieval in that context. There is a joke in European medieval studies that whenever an explanation has to be found for transition from the medieval into the modern era in Europe, and none as forthcoming historians naturally turn to the Black Death. Consequently, the Black Death has also been proposed as the reason for the emergence of more bounded territorial states. Leaving alone the merits of that argument, in our times we saw how the pandemic caused a return of not just international but also sub-regional borders, and that is borders between provinces and regions within nation states. So there, there might be some logic to that of borders being reinforced by pandemics. But simultaneously, we also saw a lot of cooperation across other fields of interaction, especially internationally. The economy relocated in a sense to the cyberspace as its primary domain as people began working from home, can using the cloud. Industry, I believe, has moved to the cloud now. While international knowledge communities of scientists collaborated to find solutions to the crisis. We see this entire complex drama in a sense play out in cyberspace, which is its own complex domain. Now, can cyberspace be in a sense, theorized through the perspective of neo-medievalism. So I'm going to try that now, just to show how this theory might be applied to new spaces. 
So cyberspace is an important space in itself. It is virtual, but it exists and it is, it is real. It is virtual, but real. So take the role now played by in the international cyber, cyber industry or these transnational corporations which are primarily located in cyberspace who perform in a sense all the functions of a state. So they are cyber states located in cyberspace. They make rules, so they perform legislative functions, they facilitate economic transactions, and now they even perform some judicial functions, especially with regard to content policies, even banishing users from their platforms. Users of these platforms, in fact, have to abide by that framework of digital citizenship, just like they follow the law of the land for national territorial citizenship. So this, this is a new geotechnological domain and nation states, have to negotiate with these cyber states and find some common ground. So we see that overlapping loyalty and we see these multiple levels of authority again coming into the picture. So that this is an interesting exercise and of course I could take this theorization deeper and uh, I might do so in a future, future episode. So uh, new medievalism might also be applied to geoeconomics. So we see various trade deals, economic blocks and free trade areas and they create structures of authority over nation states. And the most prominent example of this, of course, is the European Union, which through gradual economic integration ultimately began to accumulate sovereign power over and above nation states which constituted it, but allowed local communities in different regions, such as, such as say, Scotland, which is contemplating an exit from Britain to join the European Union, and other communities across Europe, which are local regional communities, so in Spain, which, uh, which have begun to reassert their local identity. And because of this overarching structure of the European Union, the nation state, which is at the second level of importance in terms of scale, might have become less important for regional communities, which begin to reassert themselves in this, this globalization, globalization dynamic. So some observers have also argued that we are witnessing a different kind of geoeconomic integration in the Belt and Road Initiative. And that might also lead to some kind of neo medieval, neo medieval world. And uh, we should also keep in mind another very important dimension of neo medievalism. Now, perhaps I should have spoken about this in the main part of the presentation. So this is this is equally important. Now, recently, this question of a new medieval age has taken up an economic dimension in the context of rising inequality and concentration of wealth with simultaneous concentration of knowledge production in these elite knowledge communities or epistemic communities. So this is happening simultaneously with what some are calling the death of the middle class. So the international business community, these epistemic community, communities that is cloistered uh, academic circles working from the ivory towers and the international business class of policy makers. So they, in fact, once the middle class gets squeezed out, they might become the new feudal class unless more balanced societies are created. So that is a new way of looking at a coming medieval age. So just like the balance of power is necessary outside in the international system horizontally between nation states, so it is also important within societies and vertically. And unless you have a balance of power in your classes and your class systems, you ultimately lead to some kind of, well, for want of a better word, anarchy. <laughs>